Jeff Brom finally spoke about his impressive 2024 transfer portal class on today's episode of the Locked On Global Podcast. We're explaining why his comments made about Tyler Shuck shed some light on the quarterback position for the offseason and heading into next year. Also identifying what the common denominator was for Brom in terms of portal recruiting. We're also discussing Jeff Walls getting fined for his post-game press conference comments regarding a very controversial call made late in the game against Syracuse. That said, stay tuned. You are Locked On Louisville, your daily podcast on the Louisville Cardinals. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, what's going on, everyone? Welcome into another episode of the Locked On Louisville Podcast. I'm your host, Dalton Pence. Today's episode brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers join today. You'll get $150 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. As always, I want to personally thank you all for making us your first listen of the day. Just a reminder, the Locked On Global Podcast is free on all streaming services, five days a week, your team, every day. Jeff Brown finally got to speak to the media about his very impressive transfer portal class this offseason. His comments made about Tyler Shuck, however, should shed some light on how the quarterback position will be handled for the offseason and heading into next year. Also identified one common denominator, whether it be by design or not, in terms of his transfer portal recruiting, that was a player's desire to prove oneself. To conclude the show, we dive into the news on Tuesday that Louisville women's basketball head coach Jeff Walls fined for his comments that he made following a very controversial late game call against Syracuse that ultimately cost Louisville the game. So it's all about Jeff's. On today's episode of the Lockdown Global Podcast, we start in the football realm. Jeff Brom got to speak to the media about his very impressive 2024 transfer portal class last week in his post-national signing day press conference. It was an uneventful period for the Cardinals and or as it relates to high school recruiting. Not one player signed in this period. The small high school class signed during early signing day, so it was quite uneventful, not many surprises, no flips. So instinctively, the media asked Brom about his transfer portal class, and Brom got the opportunity to shed some light on sort of the tactics behind yet another successful offseason for Louisville in which they were once again one of the top winners in the transfer portal. One of the main focal points um, of the press conference was surrounding the quarterback position, and rightfully so due to the gravity of, of the impact that that position has on a team. And also because of the concerns surrounding the addition of quarterback Tyler Shuck from Texas Tech. The fan base, when he committed to the Cardinals program, was concerned with the lack of college production over his college career up until that point. You also had the injury history that he had, multiple injuries spanning over his career whether it be unlucky or not, still in that point, injuries that if they were to happen this year could be devastating for a Louisville team that is looking to maximize yet another potentially favorable schedule, right? So Brom got the opportunity to voice his extreme confidence in Shuck, stating that we understood that Shuck had an injury history coming into the, you're coming into the portal off season and alluded to the fact that he wasn't fully healthy at the point. Now, granted Shuck suffered an injury back in September one that took, or usually takes about five to six months in terms of full recovery. And that he alluded to the point that Shuck should be healthy coming up very shortly that, you know, maybe not necessarily fully for the spring, but pretty close after. And this was an injury that Brom has had some familiarity with, um, he pointed to you know David Blau having that injury, multiple players at Purdue that he had coached that had suffered from an injury, albeit unlucky, still an injury. So Brom said that they did their homework, they did as much extensive research as they could up until the point, and that they feel comfortable with the addition, that there's always going to be risk when it comes to injury. So um, they felt comfortable with uh, – taking that risk with Shuck, but ultimately voicing that extreme vote of confidence, stating that the talent is there 
He sees the field well. The veteran experience is there for Shuck that when he has played, he has looked good. But the main thing is, as we say, the best ability at the end of the day is availability. And this will be Shuck's seventh year in the collegiate ranks. Spent three seasons with Oregon, three seasons with Texas Tech. Never threw for over 1,600 yards in a season. Never threw for over 13 touchdowns in a year. Um, But the talent-wise, it's there. And you can see that on film. You can see that in the highlights that when he's on the field, he's really solid. The issue is you you put a lot of emphasis on that word win because it's a matter of staying healthy. Um, I I thought it was very interesting. One of the first things that Brom said about Shuck was, and I quote, he's coming here with the true purpose, true purpose to prove himself and ultimately to play at the next level. He expects Shuck to get fully healthy pretty soon. Also made a very interesting comment about the other quarterbacks on the roster because that's been a sort of uh, topic of discussion over the past couple months is that, well, Louisville might be going to the portal, but is it to add a starting level player or is it to add a guy who's going to compete? Ultimately, by default, it's all a competition. But judging based upon Brahms' comments, it shouldn't really surprise you to know that Shuck is – at least in theory, going to be QB1. Now, he has to stay healthy, and assumingly he has to win the job. But Brom made some comments about um, the other quarterbacks on the roster. The Cardinals used bowl practice to sort of um, gauge the progress of the quarterbacks, um, see what they had with the guys, and they brought another quarterback in in hopes that these other quarterbacks will continue to develop and make progress. But ultimately he wants to see more from them. So if you read between the lines here, it is uh, going to be a focal point this season to develop Brady Allen, Pierce Clarkson and Harrison Bailey. But it can also be inferred that Tyler Shuck is going to be QB one, at least heading into, um, you know, spring ball assuming he's going to be maybe limited in spring ball coming up there's no um clear timetable other than he should be fully healthy relatively soon considering the injury was back in september and it should be a four to six month recovery according to brahm and according to google according to webmd never use webmd too reliably too reliably but in terms of recovery we will so Comments you can kind of gauge. Obviously, Braum won't come out and name Shuck the QB1 right away. It's going to be something that technically he has to win. But if you're reading between the lines and you're picking up what he's putting down, I think it's fairly obvious that Shuck was brought here sort of like Jack Plummer, an opportunity for a veteran to take this offense to the next level and to prove himself while also giving time for the other quarterbacks to develop. I felt like that was the whole point of this upcoming offseason, of this upcoming year, and it felt like this was always going to be the move, that Louisville goes back to the transfer portal, gets a one-year guy that can come in and be a stopgap for a year, and then you turn the keys to an open competition next offseason between Allen between Clarkson, between Deuce Adams, etc. I felt like that was always the move. And it seems like this was confirmed by what Brom said regarding bowl season. They used bowl season to really gauge where the team was. And it can be inferred that if you spent all bowl season sort of um, really analyzing the quarterback position and post-holiday bowl, you felt the need to go to the portal to get a veteran guy. I say all that to say this. I find it truly, truly hard to believe that Tyler Shuck, a seventh-year quarterback, was brought to this program to be backup or to even compete. He comes here to essentially be the guy. Theoretically, could he lose the starting role? If he's not healthy, he could. If he underperforms, he could. Just because he's the projected QB1 doesn't mean that at the end of the day he is verbatim going to be the QB1 for the remain or for the entirety of the season. 
because Clarkson or Allen or Bailey could rise onto the scene and they could play really well. They could turn heads significantly in the offseason and force Brahms' hand to where there's a little bit of a different discussion here in August. But judging based upon this in February, I think it's okay to have the discussion that two things can be true at one time. Number one, Tyler Shuck was brought to Louisville to be the QB1. The confident, uh, or the vote of confidence from Brom backs that up. Number two, you still have faith in guys like Pierce Clarkson and Brady Allen and Harrison Bailey, you know, because he said it's all guys on deck at the quarterback position for the 2024 season because injuries will happen. Not saying that they're going to happen to this position, but they happen all over the field. So, it's next man up. Everyone has to stay ready. It's developing the room as a whole. Just because Shuck is the QB1 this year doesn't mean that they're not paying a ton of attention and investing a ton in the development of the other players. So I found that to be the very interesting part of this press conference. Another interesting point that Brom made was that there wasn't really a ton of blueprints in terms of similarities of portal recruiting, but there was one common denominator, and we'll talk about that um, denominator here momentarily after we talk about our friends and the title sponsor of the show, FanDuel. Get buckets with your first bet on FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get 150 bucks in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's 150 bucks if your bet wins. Bet on all your favorite NBA players and teams with the quick bets, Live same game parlays, exclusive props, and more. Visit fanduel.com slash locked on and shoot your shot. FanDuel, the official sports partner or sportsbook partner of the NBA. Cardinal fans, thanks again for making Locked On Mobile your first listen of the day. Just a reminder, Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. And now it's also available on Amazon Fire TV in the free Fire TV channels app. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. Find Locked On Sports Today now available on the free Fire TV channels app. The common denominator of this incredibly impressive 2024 transfer portal recruiting effort that the Louisville Cardinals put forth this offseason was, whether it be by design or not, a player's desire to prove themselves. Brom admitted that, you know, they're, they're going to uncover every stone. If there's a player out there that can help them win, they're going to do their due diligence in terms of scouting, in terms of analysis, and if it's a good fit for the team, they'll bring them in. It doesn't matter if it's power five. It doesn't matter if it's group of five. It doesn't matter if it's the high school ranks. This is something that um, Brom stated in last week's press conference that I thought uh, sort of echoed my pre-existing thoughts on the situation, and that was that every offseason is different. Can Louisville sustain bringing in 27 to 28 transfers a year? Probably not. But Brom himself made comments throughout the fall. Uh, he made comments last offseason, made comments last week that it, it's going to be different with every offseason. In a perfect world, you are going out into the high school class and you are bringing in players, developing them, and allowing them to help you win. But he acknowledged that in the era of the one-time transfer, actually multiple-time transfer, I guess you should, you should be able to say, that's not really all that applicable. It's a pipe dream. So you have to use the portal. Will they use 28 to 29 scholarships on portal players every year? Probably not. But he pretty much emphasized that it's a healthy balance. Going as far as saying that there's no ratio in terms of ideal numbers at the high school to portal levels. So yes, I think the high school numbers will be lower than they usually are traditionally. But it's not going to be a, a thing where he completely, um, you know, turns away from high school recruiting. He's still going to emphasize um, high school recruits. So, uh, but the main denominator was the desire for a player to prove oneself. 
that was something that Brom continually hammered home on in his press conference that he mentioned over and over um, as it relates to different players. We just talked about Tyler Shuck, um, a couple others. Isaiah Cummings was brought up, a player that um, wants to get the opportunity to, to prove that he can be serviceable against top competition. Local guy, Penny Boone, a player who didn't really play all that well at Maryland, transferred to Toledo, was an All-American. Mac Offensive Player of the Year, comes back to the Power 5 level, wants to prove that, that he can have a sustained level of production at a top you know, level of play. The Tennessee guys, Tyler Barron, Wesley Walker, Tamaria McDonald, all three want to prove that they – you know, can take that next step in that development, can play the position that they want to play and do it at a high level. So the players that, uh, and, and those are just the ones that he talked about. There's other players mentioned as well. But you can infer when you look at some of these guys that he brought in, Antonio Meeks from the D2 level wants to prove that he can do it at the D1 level. Colin Lacey uh, from the group of five wants to prove that he can do it at the power five. All these players that they brought in are having one thing in common, and that is the desire to prove themselves. Because from a similarity standpoint, not a ton of parallels to draw. I think Brom made it a point of emphasis to specifically say that they are willing to go into group of five uh, transfer portal pockets and get players that succeeded at a lower level of play. Even going further into saying that Louisville has sort of become a program that permits that type of move and has, you know, exemplified that, hey, you can come to Louisville like Tyler Hudson, like uh, Jamari Thrash, and succeed a ton. Hence, Colin Lacey could be the next in line for that. Penny Boone could be in the next in line for that. So group of five, power five um, players that either didn't play a ton at their previous stops looking to carve out better playing time, rotational guys looking to become starters, guys at the group of five looking to do what they did in their previous stops at the power five level, or even power five guys that were pretty successful looking to take that next step and show that they can you know, play in the NFL on Sundays. So for me, it's really a matter of not necessarily having a blueprint, but knowing what you're looking for in a player. And it seems like Brom and company have sort of narrowed down a couple of characteristics that they are looking for in players. Um, you know, sort of like the women's basketball side of things, you know, Jeff Walls that we're about to talk about here coming up in the next segment. Walls is a recruiter that emphasizes defense, that emphasizes tenacity, grit, uh, two-way effort, uh, an established motor, you know, that I'm going to get up in your face and defend you, and I'm going to give maximum effort for 40 minutes. They're a gritty team. Walls recruits players that – emphasize those values, emphasize the Louisville first, you know, wearing Louisville on their chest. Um, and that's the thing that matters most type mentality. And Jeff Brom sort of has his own way of doing that, going and getting players that want to prove themselves. And whether that's by design or not, the reality of the situation is, is that it is a notable parallel to identify. Because there's not a blueprint that Brom headed into the seat or headed into the offseason with. Obviously, you have a um the desire to improve your roster at certain positions and overall increase depth, but <coughs> definitely a spot <coughs> excuse me that um I feel like Louisville is in good with because of the transfer portal efforts and by sort of sticking with this trend is a way of Louisville being able to create an identity. I know that you say, well, it's hard to really create a culture 
when you are continually turning over the roster via the portal? Well, that's sort of an every team type issue because you're always turning over the roster in the transfer portal era. But going out and getting guys with the same type of mindset allows you to create and uphold a culture that can span over just one year or so. So I thought that that was um, a pretty neat trend to talk about um, in terms of Brahms press conference. But like I said, it's all about the Jeffs on today's episode of the show. Unfortunately, um, not all for the right reasons. Women's head basketball coach Jeff Walls fined $20,000 for his post-game comments scrutinizing the officiating following a very controversial call um, after the Syracuse game. And let's be honest, Jeff Walls was right. We're going to explain why here momentarily after we talk about our friends over at eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. What brings home the winning trophy is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. From superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more, whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time, or you get your money back because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay Guaranteed Fit only available to U.S. customers. Final segment of the show, and this is a very um, passionate topic to discuss because, let's be honest, as it relates to Louisville and the ACC, many Cardinal fans are not huge fans of the um, league officiating. There is the style of thinking that many Cardinals fans believe that um, Louisville doesn't really sit in good graces with the ACC, that the Cardinals are uh, recipients of a ton of bad calls. You go back to Wake Forest in the, um, what was that, 2021 with the whole field goal debacle. You have the North Carolina basketball game in 2022 with, with the uh, with the technical foul, with the foul at the end of the game. Another, and then the goaltending call against Syracuse last week for the men's basketball team. Women's basketball officiating doesn't necessarily have a good rep. Um, it is revered as subpar, I'll be completely honest. And what happened on Sunday won't help the narrative. At the end of the game, Louisville leading by one. Olivia Cochran fouls an opposing Syracuse guard. Um, the Cardinals had fouls to give. They saw that there was a mismatch for the Qs, and with the foul to give, they um, fouled to halt the momentum with a couple seconds to go. I think it was like 2.5 to go, and Syracuse would have to inbound the ball. A common play throughout basketball. Well, officials called it an intentional foul, and Jeff Walls was not happy um post game he made some comments paraphrasing here stating that someone has to be held accountable that was one of that was actually he said that was the worst call that he's seen in his entire head coaching career it was a call that um if you're going to call it that way would completely change how the game of basketball is called the ACC responded on Tuesday finding the University of Louisville for Walls's comments $20,000 mainly stating that it's an interpretation call and the official interpretation of the call was well within their rights to do so I will say two things number 1 officiating never loses a game entirely and number two, officials are people. They make mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes. Nobody's perfect. However, I agree with what Jeff said for two reasons. Number one, officials never have to take accountability for their actions. Nothing happens. If a bad call is made, it might get addressed in a BS statement a couple days after the game, but nothing will happen. 
most of the time it's not officiating. Like I said, everyone makes mistakes, but sometimes you have to answer for those mistakes. And there's no reprimanding of it. And it continues to be an issue. Now, I'm not just saying that this is a global issue, but officiating as a whole, it seems like college basketball officiating has sort of dwindled in the past couple of years. And I don't mean to sound like a sore loser, but the call was was borderline unacceptable. But to my point, the first point I'm making, officials never have to answer for their calls. And, you know, coaches have to answer for their mistakes. Players have to answer questions in the post game. Um, they have to answer for their mistakes. Officiating is like one of the only professions that I can even think of that you can make a mistake. You can make a period of mistakes or you can make a uh, a consistent amount of mistakes in a certain period of time and not even have to answer for them. So it is what it is. That's my rant. Number two, the call was horrific. And it had its impact on Louisville because now with the Cardinals losing that game, they fall to 20 and five instead of 21 and four. If they win, they're tied for first place in the ACC. Now that they lost, they are essentially at the moment Tied for third with NC State. They're behind Syracuse. Instead of having that tiebreaker with the Qs, now it's up in the air. Not only that, but you affect overall seating. The Cardinals sitting at 18th in the AP poll are looking to try to improve their seating. A win on the road against Syracuse robbed them of a great opportunity to do so. I'm not going to complain about the whole loss being on that one play because the Cardinals had a lead throughout the entirety of the game pretty much, and they blew it. One game does not come down to one play or one call. We're going to remain consistent in that line of thinking. However, that call in its entirety, default. Now, Syracuse could have had an opportunity to score, but with two and a half seconds down one, Louisville was at least with at better odds. You still have a chance to defend. Syracuse got points with no opposition. It was called an intentional foul. By rule, is it an intentional foul? I guess. I mean, Olivia Cochran didn't really go for the ball. She went for the player. So I guess by definition of the rule books, it is. So what the ACC said isn't necessarily incorrect. But look at the precedent. In my 25 years on this earth, in almost pretty much every single basketball game that I've watched, and I'm a very avid basketball fan, it's my favorite sport. I've never once seen it interpreted that way, let alone in that situation. Because you're stating that if a player's not going for the ball, then every single time it should be an intentional foul because there was no um, you know, malicious intent. She fouled a player to create a mismatch. She had fouls to give. So does that mean that every time a team has fouls to give at the end of the game to try to get to the bonus, to get to the other team to the free throw line, to get them another opportunity of the possession, does that mean it's automatically an, an intentional foul? What precedent are we setting here? That's my question. Every time a player gets fouled and they're not going for the ball, it's – you see that you're kind of opening Pandora's box here. I've just never seen that call interpreted that way, especially when you read the room. You cannot make that call with two and a half seconds to go in a one-point game. You can, but, man, that's a really, really tough way to make that call. And I'm doing my best not to sound like a sore loser, which I feel like the only people who agree with that call are probably people that live in the state of New York and are Syracuse fans or Syracuse alumna or alumni. It, it was a bad call. One of the worst calls that, frankly, I've ever seen. Um, but it is what it is. Jeff Walls was right for his post-game press conference comments. But enough of me ranting. That's going to conclude um, today's episode of the Locked on Global podcast. We'll see you right back here tomorrow. Everyone have a great day.